Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. Today, the second day of the month of ER, 5775. An amazing new month has just begun. It's also the 17th day of the counting of the Omer and 21st of April, 2015. And this week, this Shabbat, here in the land of Israel, the double Torah portion in the book of Aikra, Leviticus of Acharemot and Kedoshim. We've begun a brand new month, the month of ER. It's a really amazing time with the deepest biblical roots and the most incredible role, I think, in the future as well. But first, of course, this is a special edition of Temple Talk, and indeed, this is a special week because tonight we begin Yom HaZikaron, the Memorial Day for Israel's fallen soldiers. And I've always been amazed at the, the way in which Memorial Day goes into Yom HaAtzma'ut, uh, Independence Day this year. We are celebrating the 67th anniversary of the establishment of the State of Israel. These are holidays that, frankly, are of biblical proportion. And the fact is, of course, Yom HaAtzma'ut is actually Hey ER, the fifth day of ER, but the um, the chief rabbinate, as it were, in the spirit of the Sanhedrin, in the spirit of the power of the rabbinical court, is bringing forward the public celebrations of Independence Day to the day before, to Thursday the 23rd of April, which is actually only the 4th of ER, in order to prevent uh, inadvertent widespread Sabbath desecration that may occur if the day is actually, if the festivities are actually held on Friday on Arab Shabbat. Um, of course, my wife's birthday is Hey ER, mm. and she's not as old as the state of Israel, and uh, her birthday remains um, Friday, the fifth day of ER, actually. But tonight, here in Israel Yitzhak, we will be observing Memorial Day for, fall, for fallen soldiers and an incredibly um, overwhelming and and uh, just staggering number of 23,000, I believe, 23,320 soldiers is the total number um, that have been killed while uh, protecting the state of Israel. Um, the numbers are, um, are kind of um, beyond proportion for us to hear. Um, Yitzhak, did you know that there are 553 soldiers uh, that are unaccounted for, that have never been never been properly buried. I did um, not know that. There are 4,958 uh, widows of IDF soldiers. Um, there are 52 military uh, cemeteries in the small state of Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe 116 soldiers have been killed since last year's and many, many orphans. I don't know that you mentioned the number of orphans. I but, haven't uh, got that figure. I haven't got that figure. And many, you know many what? orphans. The, the, um, this week we have a, a Torah portion video uh, where we uh, made a, uh, a connection between the Parshiot uh, of Achrimot and Kedoshim and, uh, and Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzma'ut. And I, I mentioned there a, a, st a very moving story about... Um, one of the great uh, rabbis of uh, the previous generation who passed away uh, a number of years ago, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, mm -hmm. who was a universally recognized uh, sage of the ultra-Orthodox community, was very, very well-beloved and very much uh, l loved the entire Jewish nation. And there's an incredible story about a, about a fellow who came to him, one of his yeshiva boys came to him, asking for permission to, to leave the yeshiva to go on a trip to the north of Israel to the famed tombs of the righteous uh, tzaddikim from the, day, the days of, uh, of the Mishnah and the Talmud and the temple times that are buried in the north of Israel to pray there at these holy places. And um, he said to him, to this boy, why do you have to go all the way uh, to the north of Israel to find the graves of Tzadikim of the righteous when here in Mount Herzl in Jerusalem you have the greatest Tzadikim of all, the soldiers who who were in the IDF who perished in the defense of, of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. So it's a day of, of tremendous significance because there's nobody really in the state of Israel that um, is unaffected, either directly or or, or very close in some personal relationship 
by by these staggering losses. And I think that you know the, the there is something very very um, not just emotive, almost mystical about the connection and the passage between Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzmaut. You know the feeling of of um, of Yom HaZikaron, I mean, and that's really what it is. It's a preparation. It is a it is a vestibule. It is the hachshara of how we merit to Yom HaAtzmaut. And um, I can't imagine anyone not being filled with a tremendous sense of um, debt of gratitude, a debt of of appreciation to to those that have given their lives for the state of Israel. And it's a, it's just a, a totally overwhelming thing to to live with, really, mm-hmm. for all of us. Um, Yom Ha'atzmaut itself, the day the day of independence, is a is a day of uh, I, I think tremendous religious sentiment, and um, you know you and I we've been through that <laughs> we've been through a lot, been here a long time, and I don't th- I don't understand people I don't understand Jewish people who do not feel that they belong here who do not understand the significance of the state of Israel, who do not feel a religious obligation and a human obligation to be part of what's going on here, and who do not see the hand of God uh, in every single moment of our history here. So when, when I say that it, it's a day of, of extreme joy, when I say that it's a day of, um, I believe, of, uh, of biblical proportions, when I say that it's a, it's a time uh, of... Um, of a, of a modern day miracle, I don't think these are just platitudes. Um, I, I don't think this is just um, the raw emotion of uh, of, a, of a religious Zionist. I think I can prove it, and I'll tell you how. Because as you know, our holy sages teach that every month on the calendar has a, a, its own tikkun, has its own special theme, and also every one of us, in our own way, has our own part to play in God's plan for the ultimate redemption. And, you know, actually this month, the month of ER, the Torah calls it <coughs> the second month. And also in the Torah, there's another name for it. Do you remember? Ziv. Exactly. Zion Yudvav in the book of Kings 1, chapter 6 and verse 1, we find that under the, the, the rule of King Solomon, construction of the first temple actually began during this month, testified to by the Bible. Kings 1, chapter 6 and verse 1 tells us that the work began during the month of Ziv. So, do you understand what we're saying? That construction on the Beit HaMikdash began during this month? I'll tell you what it means for me. Because I look at the state of Israel as being the, the, um, the, the, the template of what do I mean to say the, the preparation of the the precursor the, the precursor the infrastructure for the third temple, and so and so as far as I'm concerned it's like this is the end of the show I got nothing else to say it's so obvious to me that Shlomo HaMelech began construction of the first temple which is the which is the 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 real uh, period of of Jewish history in which the Shechina was part of everyday life here in Jerusalem, going out to the whole world, the Divine Presence began in the month of Ziv, and then the State of Israel is established during that very same month. And, and I think that that is, is, is actually, um, that, that, whole, that whole idea that I'm, I'm trying to give over is, in a nutshell, the, the whole essence of the character of the month is one of preparation and anticipation for something. Um, look, and, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Look, th- what is this month? This entire month is um, taken up with observing the Omer, right? It started at the end of Nisan, or in the middle of Nisan. It ends in the very beginning, the first week of of next month of Sivan. But the entire month of Iyar is, is its total essence is the counting of the Omer. And you shall count for yourselves, Leviticus 23. And we know what that is. We discussed it last week. It's a great spiritual progression from of seven complete weeks from... Passover to Shavuot and the Sinai Revelation when the people of Israel will receive the Torah. But, uh, but part and parcel, hand in hand with the counting, the anticipation, the preparation of the month of Iyar is it's a time of deep healing 
And this is a very deep tradition that ER spelled in Hebrew. And again, the, the, the Torah calls the month Ziv, and it calls it the second month because we start counting in Nisan. The, the Babylonian names of the, um, of the months have very, very deep spiritual significance that our sages were trying to couch certain messages in these names. And the prophets discuss these names. And the, and the name is called ER, which is Aleph Yud Yud Rish, which actually is an acronym for the words Ani Hashem Rofecha. I, the Lord, will, hear, will heal you. And that, of course, uh, or I, the Lord, am your healer, that is found in the verse, in the book of Exodus, chapter 15, and verse 26, um, speaking about the, um, the ills of Egypt. God says, I, the Lord, am your healer. And that's an allusion to the concept that this month of ER, on a deep mystical level, is associated with healing and well-being. The reason for that, or, or rather a, a time for focusing on, uh, on becoming whole, becoming pure. Can I add here right now? Can I just that, explain uh, the reason for that? The word ER itself means illumination from the word uh, or, light, avir, or light, ziv also means brightness. Absolutely. Kudos to you for pointing that out. They both are, uh, have a connotation of light. And there's no light like being like being whole and healthy and wholesome, absolutely. Yeah. Especially as a nation, not just as an individual. But the but the reason for this connection is the tradition that the the manna that fell for the children of Israel in the desert to nourish them while they were wandering began to fall during this month. And our sages of blessed memory have many ways of deriving the secrets of healing and nourishment and good health from the secret concepts of the manna. All that being said about what ER was, what, how it's reflected in Torah, in these verses, okay, we got, we got several ideas now that are dovetailing. We have the idea of the, it being the time of the beginning of the construction of the first temple. We have the idea of it being the time when the manna began to fall from heaven, which also, by the way, is a direct indication of Hashem's hashkacha, his tremendous caring and, and, um, and providence over the children of Israel. A time of preparation, a time of counting, anticipation, the whole month is taken up with that. It's, it's become in our time also intrinsically bound up with the modern day festivals of which triumph Jewish survival and the miraculous birth of the state of Israel. So in the, in the month of ER, we have Holocaust Memorial Day. We have Yom HaZikaron, the day, the day of the memorial of fallen soldiers. We have the Independence Day. And don't forget that we also will be having Yom Yerushalayim mm -hmm. on Chavchet, on the 20th day of ER. We'll be celebrating also Jerusalem Day which is the reunification of, of, of uh, Jerusalem during the Six-Day War of 1967. And it seems to me not at all a stretch to say that on the deepest level, um, the state of Israel in Israel's inception during this month is none other than the continuation of the work of King Solomon, that King Solomon began at this very time. Because this, and this is the whole thing here of, what, of, what, of why we are moved and and why we are celebrating and uh, this the state of israel why we are celebrating not the day of yom Hatz, but, but the state itself yes there it is unabashedly we are celebrating this day because it is the very embodiment of the month of er i challenge you what did i just say about the month of er that it is about preparation anticipation and healing there you go the state of Israel is the embodiment of these themes. And, and uh, it's not finished yet at all. Our prayer is that we should participate in the continuation of these miracles, the ingathering of the exiles, the building of the temple, and, and, and then we will indeed merit to see that the state of Israel is the vessel for the, the, the complete redemption of the Jewish people and, and humanity. But this is exactly what... Uh, what it's all about and it's it's a day of tremendous tremendous religious significance for a Jew anywhere in the world 
to realize that that this is our home. You know, in in um, 1956, the United States of America adopted as its official motto the words "In God We Trust." Mm -hmm. And that expression has a very interesting history. It first appeared on U.S. coins in 1864 and has appeared on paper currency since 1957. And apparently there's been a lot of controversy in America as to whether or not that expression is a violation of the separation of church mm -hmm. and state. It's quite an interesting article in Wikipedia, of course. <laughs> but you know what? That's the whole thing right there, that that is what the state of Israel must be all about <laughs> whether or not people exactly. admit it or not. You know, that is, that is the old story of, of our constant uh, struggle for meaning, for identity, for understanding of who it is that we are and, who, and where it is that we're going. That's the whole issue of everything facing us in the state of Israel. But that's it in, in God We Trust. The state of Israel is screaming in God we trust from every rock and stone. This is, this is exactly what is going on here. It is, a, is it, it is a manifestation, not only of in God we trust, but in my opinion, of God trusting us. And, and you know, that's one of the most beautiful Torah thoughts that we've ever shared. You know, a Jew wakes up in the morning and lying in bed, before we wash our hands, we say, Right? What does that mean? I admit before you, Hashem, a living and, and, and um, eternal uh, king, that you return my soul to me. You return my soul to me in, in compassion, period. And some people mistakenly say, Bechemla Rabbah. Bechemla, period. Rabbah emunatecha. And then we say, Great is your, your faith. faith. This is very profound thought. What does that mean? What do those words mean? That, we, that, that you got Jews, millions of Jews, I, I wish, <laughs> all over the world, mumbling these words with the sleep in their eyes. It's a very ancient prayer that we say immediately upon awakening. Rabbah Emunatecha, great is your faith. Shouldn't it be? Shouldn't it be? Great is my faith in you that you returned my soul to me. Whoa! Thank you so much for returning mm -hmm. your, my soul to me. No, Rabba Emunatecha. Exactly. Great is your faith yeah, that you had so me. much faith in me that I can do it. I got another day here. I got another day that you're giving me another chance. I really appreciate your having the faith in me that I can do it. And that says so much, and that's what, that's what the state of Israel is all about. It's our, it's our chance to really do it right, to continue the theme of, of Shlom HaMelech, to continue the healing process. And that healing is not only for every individual in the nation of Israel, but for the whole world. That's what the state of Israel is supposed to bring to the whole world. And I think it is definitely happening. And I gotta tell you, I just had the opportunity this week to accompany a group that was traveling uh, all throughout the land, and we were we were in the north of Israel, and we were in the heartland of Israel, and in Benjamin, we were in Eish Kodesh, and we were in Itamar, and this land is so amazing, and so incredible, and so misunderstood, and so holy, and every every part of it is so different, and. There's no way to to explain this to people that are that are um, not uh, not listening, and not ready to understand that that God is really alive and well and beckoning to us, to um, to take our place in history. So this day is 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 tremendously, um, you know, um, programmed into the from the beginning of history into the month of. Uh, of ER, that's that whole Atbash thing, you know, about about mm -hmm. how actually, according to, the, to this ancient uh, medieval uh, code that that was that was known by our sages, of determining the the the, the uh, certain festivals and days of of, of uh, commemoration throughout the year according to the the key of of the days of Pesach, the last day of Pesach, 
uh, Zion always falls out on the letter Ayin, according to Atbash, which is the first letter is equal to the last letter. It's an ancient cipher. Always falls out on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, meaning that there is a pattern uh, in history and time that was set into motion from the very beginning of time. All I'm trying to say is that it's a, pro it's a prophecy come true, Yom Ha'atzma'ut. It's a prophecy come true. And... Um, I think that every prophet of Israel d m saw it. I think that Ezekiel's dry bones and Ezekiel's uh, at some uh, at some moment, and yeah. Ezekiel's proclamation that when that when the temple is rebuilt, the whole world will understand and know that Hashem is in our midst. That's what the state of Israel is leading to, and that's what it's all about. So I, for one, am just wanting to publicly declare that I thank Hashem very, very much for giving us the ability to live here. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't do it. Uh, what? All you got to do is hop on a plane, and you're here. And uh, I think history will be very harsh on those that don't take advantage of, of the opportunity that we have today. And thank God, thank God, Yitzchak, when we, ha when we were still young and handsome, uh, we had the, uh, for the, the foresight to um, to make this move, and to and to r set on a new course, the countless generations of our family that will follow us because of the fact that we came here. And and all I can say is, I'm just very 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 moved and thankful and um, and humbled to be able to live here. It's it's the greatest privilege of of anyone's wildest dreams for a Jew to be able to live in the land of Israel and you know what the best is yet to come the best is yet to come I mean, I've been in this country now Rabbi for 34 years meaning more than half the history of the modern state of Israel and you know the first 10 years 15 years 20 years I was here I was always you know had the feeling like oh, I missed I missed the you know, the year is full of action. But as I look back now for 34 years, things have changed so much. You and your big mouth. Time. Things have changed so much that uh, we, you really are living and witnessing history. It's really fascinating and humbling to be part of it. I could actually do with a little less action. <laughs> if the music stay with us as we uh, pay homage to the state of Israel, thank God. Thank God every day for our beautiful, miraculous home, the state of Israel. Join us in celebrating Yom HaSma'ut. We wish all Israel and the whole world total freedom, redemption, independence, and most of all, connection to Hashem, fear of God, the beginning of true wisdom. Stay with us. Temple Talk. First day of the month of April that I mentioned, the year, the Hebrew year is 5775. And Rabbi, I have a few comments. Uh, I'd like to hearken back to a few things that you said earlier. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, add something new. You mentioned earlier the linkage between Yom HaZikaron, the Memorial Day, and Yom Matzmut, Independence Day. Of course, we go from uh, sadness to joy, which is it's the theme of so many psalms, you know, the you took my sadness and turned it into joy. Psalm it, 30. It's, a, it's a very, very, very ancient Jewish theme. My daughter the other day was saying, you know, I think they should change it. I don't think it's right. You know, people are 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 remembering their loved ones and it's very painful. And then all of a sudden to just, you know, fireworks and, and celebration, it's just not fair. It's not nice to do that to them. And I said, I think it's the very opposite because that's how we show the gratitude where we can't be joyful if we don't share their loss and sadness and they can't be joyful and they can't be, and their, and their sadness and, and loss isn't meaningful without the joy that follows. And it reminds me also of 
the uh, minhag, the custom we have at the end of the seven days of mourning when someone's lost a loved one, a parent, and uh, someone uh, physically extends their arm to the person who for seven days has been sitting on the floor or in a low spot uh, as a symbol of mourning and physically helps them up, physically brings them out of their state of mourning because they have to get on with it and, and life returns and we have to continue to live. That's the message of Torah. Secondly, there's something that I've mentioned before, I think maybe even mentioned it a week ago in last week's Temple Talk, which is always you know, somewhat jocular, but I think there's a very deep significance to it, and that is the actual manner in which Israelis of all ilks, uh, stripes, stripes <laughs> celebrate Yom Atzma'ut's Independence Day, and that is to take a barbecue, what we call here a mongol. I don't know where that word comes from, but that's what we call it. <laughs> And whether you, in your backyard, or whether you go to a national park, or whether you go to a parking lot, and I've seen people do this also, open up the trunk and, you know, put the, put the barbecue uh, on their top of their car. Or I know that my very door. best friend in the world had to buy, like, a new gas balloon because he has a brand new yeah. gas-powered uh, grill. And, uh, and grill some meat. And you know the the aroma of 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 grilling of grilled meat is all over the the land, and uh, can it's I grill very some festive. Uh, soy, hmm? Can I grill a soy burger or something? You can do a do a soy burger. Yeah, that's acceptable too. And of course, to me, it always is very uh, reminiscent uh, of our ancient festivals, particularly Passover, Pesach, the Korban Pesach which we've been discussing so much uh, this past month, uh, the idea that the entire nation gets together and celebrates our freedom, our independence, um, by cooking meat. It is considered by Torah to be a symbol uh, of, of gladness, of joy, that we can do this. This is a, a luxury that God gives us, that we can... We can celebrate in this manner, but to me, it, it's a sign today in Yom Atzmut, a sign of something that is so deep and instinctual in the people of Israel, that this is how we collectively express our joy and gratitude. Um, it may sound, again, you know, it always sounds kind of jocular, but uh, there's something very deep here. And uh, God willing, uh, it will... It will uh, someday be an encore to the Korban Pesach that we all will, will bring uh, and, and enjoy on, on the first day of Passover. Also, since we're talking about all that, you mentioned the different holidays of the month of Iyar. I'm not sure you mentioned Pesach Sheni, the second Passover. Oh my goodness, which in, of course, in my litany I forgot Pesach Sheni. Which of course is the, uh, the, the opportunity for those who are in a state of impurity during the first Pesach to bring a Korban Pesach, an offering on the uh, 14th, 14th of, uh, of yeah. ER, one month after the first uh, day of the offering of the, of the Pesach. And of course, we always discuss, and it'll be coming up, uh, it's not for a while yet in the reading, not for a while, it's in the two numbers. Weeks. Um, is it in two weeks so soon? I'll tell you exactly what it is. But uh, it's, it's we always to be observed on understand Sunday. this as Sunday, the, oh, the, oh, the, the actual day, day will be in two May. weeks. Yeah, of course, in two weeks. So I'm thinking of the reference uh, in, in Torah itself. Which Sunday, is May not, 3rd. But um, it is actually the holiday of second chances, second opportunities. And that uh, occurred exactly to me what when. the state of Israel is. Exactly. And when you mentioned the idea of Mode'ani. Uh, that your faith in us, God, is, is so strong that you give us a second chance. And if there was ever an expression of confidence and faith in a people, then the, the uh, rebirth of the state of Israel is that. Uh, and you can't, you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. What I'd like to add now, Rabbi, perhaps to open up a discussion, is the double parsha, the two portions that we're reading this week, Achrei Mot uh, Kedoshim, um, the theme which we have heard it before in previous readings, uh, 
in some of the verses of, of the Exodus, but which really becomes a dominant theme here in these parshiot is the idea of, of being an Am Kadosh, that we are Kadosh, that this is our purpose, that it's not just Holy, to, to... Separate. Not right, not just to be a free and independent people, and not just to follow the Torah that we read that received at Sinai, which of course we need to do. But there's an added aspect to this, an added dimension, which is that of holiness and, and being separate and being connected to God in all that we do. And that, you know, I'll put it this way, that's my blessing for the state of Israel, for our future, that we continue to, to be united in, in holiness with one another and, of course, with, with God. You mentioned, um, I think you referenced Ms. Moshe Chanukat Abayit Ladav at Psalm 30 when you were talking about the dichotomy between, um, um, you know, mourning and joy and mm. the extending of the hand. And, of course, that's also um, the same process that takes place in the month of Av when we go from Tisha B'Av mm -hmm. uh, the very next week to Tu B'Av, which right. is the apex of, of joy. And if you look at, at Psalm 30... It's very beautiful, and of course, it's a song for the inauguration of the temple. And it goes back and forth, you know, between emotions of feeling uh, totally um, alone and 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 uh, descended to the to the pit and and uh, lying down weeping and uh, and with Hashem's face concealed. So all of a sudden, you undid my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, and you turned my lament into dancing. And first of all, it's a very very um, you know, classic Jewish mindset and classic Jewish uh, conception of, of life and time and everything that affects us is that we, this is like the extremes of the human condition is exactly what, what our history is all about and what we, what we go through. And a very um, succinct expression of, of, of what life is all about, you know, you, you know, uh, Black Crow Blues, isn't that what it's called? <laughs> you go through uh, ups and downs. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, this is all, all um, paralleled very, very strongly and reflected in, in every detail of, of this month. And you, had, you hit it right on the head because the, the real crescendo of the month uh, on the level of, uh, of the Torah is the 14th of ER, which is the biggest proof positive of all of Hashem's faith in us, that when it comes to the collective um, national identity of the Jewish people that's reflected by the Passover offering, that as we refer to it, that national circumcision, um, we have another chance. All together. So that this month of ER is just amazing, and it is... It is um, it is just beaming and, and, and broadcasting health and healing. So it's a very important time for people that need healing to focus on being well. And being well means being, being uh, totally uh, in tune and open to, uh, to the resonance that Hashem is giving us. That's what the manna is all about. So you mentioned the, the confluence of uh, the Parshiot, mm -hmm. which of course... Once again, uh, the uh, diaspora is, is going to be reading Tazriya Matsora this week, and that's, this is still all because of the Shabbat that also was the eighth day of Pesach in the diaspora. We're reading Achrimot Kedoshim, so we're taking, we, we, we pause with Tazriya Matsora, which is the many laws of uh, the Negat Sarat and various types of uh, impurity, spiritual imbalance in the time of the Temple, and then we get back to the scene of the uh, the untimely death of Nadav and Avihu, and, the, and basically the main theme of Acharemot is first and foremost uh, the Yom Kippur service, right? Which is mm -hmm. which is what we read on Yom Kippur, and it is the uh, the proper uh, um, relationship between the Kohen and the Beit Hamikdash, and the, the confluence of space, time, and life uh, on that moment, and how how yes to come before Hashem's presence. And then, and then we have this um, description of the the service performed by the by the Kohen Gadol, by the high priest on Yom Kippur. And in chapter sixteen of Acharemot, we have this verse, this amazing verse. It states, "V'chiper al Hakodesh mitumot bnei Yisrael u'mipishehem v'chol chadotam v'chen yaser la'ohel moed hashochen itam b'toch tumatam." 
One of the most powerful, incredible verses. It's right. He's talking. The verse is talking about uh, taking the blood of the bull and sprinkling it with his forefinger upon the eastern front of the ark cover. And in front of the ark cover, he shall sprinkle seven times of the blood with his forefinger. And he shall slaughter the sin offering. He go to the people and bring its blood within the curtain. He shall do it with its blood as he had done with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it upon the ark cover and in front of the ark cover. And then 16 tells us, Thus shall he provide atonement upon the sanctuary for the contam contaminations of the children of Israel, even for the rebellious sin sins amongst all their sins. And so shall he do for the tent of meeting that dwells with them amid their contamination. The verse is saying, this is a process for the Kohen to exact a certain spiritual rectification for even for deliberate rebellious sins mm -hmm. that which it's hard to repent for, right? Because you know what you were doing, deliberate rebellious, rebellious sins, and a way for him to purify the tent of meeting that dwells with them, a reference to the Shekhinah, amid their contamination. Hashochen itam betoch tumatam, who dwells with them in the midst of their tuma, in the midst of their contamination, their impurity. And the verse is clearly reminding us that God's presence, He causes His presence to dwell amongst us in the midst of it all. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the most outrageous, deliberate sin, he still, He's still with us. He still loves us. And, you know, I level this as a response to a lot of um, critics, I think. I'll just, if you don't mind my calling them, hypocritical critics that level criticism against the state of Israel from a religious point of view, from a holier-than-thou point of view, from a self-righteous point of view, saying that, you know, it's so imperfect and it's not, you know, you can't, it won't work until Mashiach comes and it has to be run by tzaddikim and it's, you know, it's sinful and all these ridiculous statements that deny Hashem's providence over His people. And this verse is basically saying, you know what? I love you as you are. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh it, it reflects on, on that em, emunat uh, rabba emunat Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it I have confidence in saying, you, uh, yes. even in your worst, and, the and, 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 and it also uh, means there's no excuse. And as our sages point out, basically what does it mean? It means in the midst of your impurity, I am, I am with you, despite the fact that you're impure, I am still with you, exactly as the verse is saying. And uh, you know what? I, I think I must have mentioned this ten times. I think I might mention it every year. It's a, a favorite teaching of mine that I uh, learned from one of the great rabbis. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. The most beautiful analogy for, for, for anyone who hasn't heard it or for anyone who has heard it. This is, is just life-changing, right? What this verse is really saying to us about Hashem's relationship with the people of Israel is you have, a, you have a mother and a father, right? You know, the Shekhinah, this verse is referring to the Shekhinah, mm -hmm. which, is, which is, as it were, a certain feminine aspect of godliness, right? Hard to explain. What does that mean exactly? It's a certain aspect of, of, of God. God is neither male nor female, nor is he anything but intrinsically, imperatively one and perfect in his oneness without limit. But the, there's an idea of the Shekhinah that we can identify with as a certain, a certain aspect, right? So you have, you have a mother and a father, right? And they're playing with the, with the new baby and they're coddling the baby and cooing and, and enjoying the baby together, right? And the, you picture the, this young couple with a baby, right? And the, the father's holding the baby, right? And, and, and gazing lovingly at the baby. And all of a sudden, the father senses, smells, the baby has a load. <laughs> the baby has a load, what some, what some folks call a package. And the, the father looks, makes a face, turns color, and what does he do? He hands the baby to the mother. Ow. And the mother, you know what she does? She goes right on hugging and kissing the baby the same way exactly. And that's exactly what this verse is telling us. That's exactly how Hashem treats the children of Israel. And the Shekhinah HaShochein Itam Betoch Tumatam. I'm dwelling among, amidst you in the middle of your particular package in your <laughs> diaper, Am Yisrael. I still wow. love you. I still love you. And that is exactly what the deal is here. So whatever you say about the state of Israel, you hypocrite, you listen, you know what? Come here and uh, make it into a better place. That's the only answer. Do, do your very, very best to make sure that Hashem's confidence in us is validated. And the only way to do that is to be here 
And as I said um, very recently, I believe it was in last week's Torah portion, we were talking about the Neged Sarat and the, ho and the homes in the land of Israel. The, the ground in the land of Israel is made of Torah. And that's all there is to it. Speaking of uh, foul odor and uh, bad packaging. Oops. Um, I think we should talk about... Uh, I, think, I think I know what you want to talk about. I think you want to talk about the greatest irony of this program, which mm -hmm. is the only place in which we cannot revel in our independence, mm -hmm. celebrate our independence, feel our independence. The place of the Shekhinah, who dwells with us amongst our contamination, the only place where we cannot really feel that this miracle is working is none other than... Temple Mount, place of the Holy Temple, which has... Uh, continues to, to um, uh, what's the word? The dader uh, continues to, to descend. Oh, to to um, denigrate? No, no, to um, to deteriorate. Deteriorate. That's the word. Uh, the situation, the situation has become has really oh, monstrously out intolerable. Out it's been the subject of, of um, a New York Times article, that um, I had the great privilege of hmm. um, of. Um, speaking to the reporter who wrote that article over the telephone she um she went to the temple mount and she interviewed some of the of the um black clad um frightening um female um impersonator i'm sorry females on the temple mount who lay in wait um uh, with their five thousand shekel a month salary that they receive from hamas that they're there to incite and um against the Jewish visitors. She interviewed one. She found one named Mona. And she interviewed them, and she talked about how they knit things for their grandchildren and how they're so happy to be on the Temple Mount, except for the fact that, of course, that the Jews are apes and pigs. But yes, this article uh, is, has been talked about now in other media outlets, and it was basically an attempt to portray the women that we've been describing consistently and showing videos almost almost on a daily basis on the Temple Institute's ever popular Facebook page of what of what these people are doing on the Temple Mount and it was an attempt to describe this basically as like a a peace a peace loving uh, feminist kind of uh, proactive movement mm -hmm. but the article if that's the intention of the article it certainly betrays itself because you can hardly you can hardly uh, portray someone as peace loving even though one woman is described as wearing John Lennon glasses which is a big tip off oh that did it for me That's she must be off. she must be wonderful if yeah. she's wearing John Lennon glasses uh, when she's also quoted as referring to Jews as uh, pigs and apes and when they say our point here is to keep the Jews away uh, and when the article does acknowledge that it is a holy site for Jews in the place of the Holy Temple, uh, when you put all these pieces together, these uh, women um, who enjoy the, the, the birds chirping, it's mentioned, uh, and uh, the clear skies, uh, fresh air of the Temple Mount, uh, when you read the article from beginning to end, you realize that it's, 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 not, uh, it's not all uh, peaches and cream uh, concerning these women. You know, uh, of course, uh, the reporter left out most of what I said. Mm -hmm. I told her in, quite uh, clearly what happens on the Temple Mount, how the Jews are treated by these women, and the manifestation of their evil intent. And uh, she didn't find it fitting to write those things. I guess it didn't exactly support her basic premise. At least she just quoted me as saying that it's basically incitement and that it's unsettling. I said a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that, uh, again, um, a trip to the Temple Mount is very, very difficult, and I really laud and appreciate all of those people that uh, come. Uh, we go very often. I was there yesterday. I'm going again tomorrow. And Yitzhak, you're coming with me tomorrow, I hope. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult experience because of the fact that the police are are literally castrated before our very eyes they are absolutely powerless to do anything of meaning except to control the 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 jews and to keep them uh keep them under the thumb and they they are they are they seem to be overwhelmed by the growing number of jews that are coming on a daily basis and that are insisting on their right to be to be there and um there's no violence here at all 
being um, intim- being being um, intimated or, or threatened by the Jewish side, and yet every article is always describing how 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 that situation there is going to lead to violence. What does that mean exactly? Mm-hmm. And uh, again, the role of Jordan here is so clear. I mean, the, the, we we have very little time left in the show, but there, there was a whole scandal last week where the uh, Israeli ambassador to Jordan, speaking to a, a group of students here in in Israel in a university, actually said that the Temple Mount is not in our hands and that it's better that way mm-hmm. and that it's better that Jordan controls the Temple Mount and he must have been instructed by the highest office in the land uh, to um, reflect our official position, which is that the Temple Mount is not in our hands. So we still have a little bit of a ways to go towards our independence. But you know what, Yitzhak? Mm-hmm. Hashem has confidence in us. That's he has faith confidence. in us and we are ready to go the distance. We're ready to go the distance and uh, one day at a time. Tonight, of course, as you mentioned earlier, Yom HaZikaron, Memorial Day, tonight and tomorrow, and tomorrow night, Wednesday night, of course, uh, Yom HaZikaron, Independence Day for Israel. We uh, uh, wish everybody a very happy and joy-filled Independence Day, and uh, may it just be the beginning of the good things to come. The beginning of the Third Temple. Thanks for being with us. Temple Talk.